Welcome to Clinical Minute. Jenna is a 24-year-old gynecological patient who is presenting for a well woman exam and to discuss her contraceptive options. She's in a mutually monogamous, long-term relationship with a man. Both she and her partner have tested negative for sexually transmitted infections, including HIV, and they want to stop using condoms. In reviewing her health record, you are reminded that Jenna has been diagnosed with migraines without aura by her primary care provider. How do you counsel and educate Jenna? You know that 13% of the general U.S. population experiences migraines. However, among women ages 25 to 40, the prevalence is estimated at 25%. And among people seeking care from a primary care provider for recurrent episodic headaches, 90% have symptoms that warrant a diagnosis of migraine. Furthermore, you know that women are disproportionately affected by migraine, particularly during reproductive years. Among women migraineurs, 70% experience menstrual-related migraines, or migraines that occur with regularity just before and or during menstruation, when estradiol levels decrease. You know that according to the ICHD-3, a migraine without aura is an episodic recurrent headache lasting 4 to 72 hours. It is a headache with at least two of the following pain qualities. Unilateral location, pulsating quality, moderate to severe pain, and aggravation or avoidance of physical activity. Also, during the headache, the patient must experience at least one of the following, nausea, vomiting, or photophobia and phonophobia. Finally, the headaches must not be better accounted for by another ICHD-3 diagnosis. Migraine with aura may be diagnosed when a patient has two or more instances of migraine with one or more of the following fully reversible aura symptoms. Visual symptoms such as bright lines, shapes, or objects. Sensory symptoms including burning, pain, or paresthesia. Speech or language symptoms from mild word-finding difficulty to dysphagia. Motor symptoms such as weakness on one side of their body. Brainstem symptoms, including dysarthria, tinnitus, diplopia, or ataxia. Or retinal symptoms, ocular migraine, monocular loss of vision. They must also have at least two of the following four characteristics. At least one aura symptom spreads gradually over five minutes or more and two or more symptoms occur in succession. Each individual aura symptom lasts 5 to 60 minutes. At least one aura symptom is unilateral, and the aura is accompanied or followed within 60 minutes by headache. As with migraine without aura, migraine with aura is diagnosed when symptoms are not better accounted for by another ICHD-3 diagnosis and transient ischemic attack has been excluded. According to the CDC guidelines, women with migraines, with or without aura, including menstrual migraines and no other risk factors for stroke, such as age, hypertension, and smoking, may use levonorgestrel releasing IUDs, single rod implants, depomedroxyprogesterone acetate, and progestin only pills without restriction. Providers should refer to the guidelines for recommendations for women with additional risk factors for stroke. When it comes to combined hormonal contraceptives, including low-dose combined oral contraceptives, defined as containing less than or equal to 35 micrograms of ethanol estradiol, the combined hormonal patch, and the combined vaginal ring, medical eligibility criteria recommendations are as follows. For women who experience migraine without aura, including menstrual migraine, the advantages generally outweigh theoretical or proven risks. For women who experience migraine with aura, combined hormonal contraception poses an unacceptable health risk and are not to be used.
You know that Jenna would be a candidate for low-dose combined oral contraceptives with a decline of less than or equal to 10 micrograms of ethanol estradiol. In fact, low-dose combined oral contraceptives can be used to prevent menstrual-related migraines, particularly when used continuously. Options would include Libral or Amethyst, both of which contain only active pills. Low Seasonique, which has a 10 microgram ethanol estradiol decline in week 13. Natasia, a quadrophasic pill with three successive drops in estradiol valerate. And Loloestrin with 10 micrograms of estrogen, which has a two-day pill-free interval each month, and a 10 microgram ethanol estradiol decline. With all of this information in mind, you meet with Jenna in your office following a normal exam. You tell Jenna that you have a couple of additional questions that you'd like to ask. She nods her head in agreement. First, you ask if she smokes cigarettes. She says no. You also ask her to remind you about whether she tends to get migraines just before or during her periods. She says that she actually kept track of this for a few months, and the migraines do happen the day she starts her period. You proceed to counsel and educate Jenna using a shared decision-making model in which you query to identify preferences, ask open-ended questions, provide information about side effects, effectiveness, and use of method, give context about options, ensure access to method placement and removal, allow time for questions, ensure informed consent. You start by commending Jenna for the decision she and her partner made to get tested for sexually transmitted infections. You ask, what are your thoughts about the type of birth control you might want to use? She says that she's not sure, since she didn't know what she could use because of her migraines. A friend of hers also has migraines, and her doctor wouldn't give her a prescription for the pill. You explain that the official recommendations about women with migraines using oral contraceptive pills depends on the type of migraines and the type of oral contraceptive. Since Jenna has migraines without aura that tend to occur right around the time of her period, combined oral contraceptives would be safe for her to take. And if she takes the oral contraceptives continuously, with no break for a period, they should help a lot with her migraines. Jenna scrunches up her face and says, I don't know if I really want to be bothered taking a pill every day, and my migraine medication works pretty well if I take it right away. You go on to ask, what do you and your partner think about having children at some point? She says that they definitely want to have kids someday, but not until they both finish grad school. Based on her answer, you explain that there are methods that she'd need to take every day, like the pill, an injection she could get every three months, or methods that are longer acting, that last several years. You ask, which of these options sound best to you? She responds that she would love something that she doesn't have to think about for a few years. Taking her preference into account, you focus on long-acting reversible contraception, or LARC, options for her, using diagrams to aid understanding. You invite her to stop you anytime she has questions. The first option is the Copper T Intrauterine Device, or IUD. It's a small T-shaped device made of plastic wrapped with copper. The Copper T IUD is approved for up to 10 years of use, but it can be removed earlier if a woman decides she wants to get pregnant. The Copper T is thought to work by preventing fertilization preventing the egg and the sperm from meeting up. It starts working immediately, so no backup birth control is needed. However, the copper tea doesn't provide protection from HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. Like any contraceptive method, they do have potential side effects and some possible complications. The copper tea can increase the length of time and amount of menstrual flow and menstrual cramping. Expulsion from the uterus is rare, occurring in only 5% of users, but is the most likely cause of failure. Expulsion is most common within the first three months after insertion. Uterine perforation is a rare complication, occurring approximately once every 770 
to 1,600 insertions. There's a small increased risk of pelvic inflammatory disease within four weeks of insertion that can be treated without removing the IUD in most cases. There's also a second type of IUD, the LNG IUD. There are four different LNG IUDs on the market. Like the copper T, LNG IUDs are made of plastic. However, they do not have copper on them. Instead, they slowly release small amounts of levonorgestrel, LNG, which is very similar to the female hormone progesterone. Depending on the LNG IUD used, they are approved for three to five years of use. A backup method of birth control needs to be used for seven days after insertion. Like the copper T, the LNG IUD doesn't provide protection from HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. LNG IUDs work by thickening the cervical mucus, making it harder for sperm to swim up into the uterus. In addition, they make the lining of the uterus, or endometrium, thinner and less welcoming for a pregnancy. During the first three to six months of LNG IUD use, bleeding may be irregular and the number of days with bleeding or spotting may be increased. After that, bleeding usually decreases. Like with the copper T, complications are rare and include perforation, infection, and malposition. You go on to tell Jenna that the third option of long-acting reversible contraception is an implant. It is a single, thin, flexible rod, four centimeters long. The implant is placed right under the skin in the upper arm and continuously releases small amounts of progestin over three years. Like any of the IUDs, it can be removed sooner if the woman decides to get pregnant. A backup method of birth control needs to be used for seven days after insertion. Like the other methods you've discussed, the implant doesn't provide protection from HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. The implant works by preventing the woman from ovulating or releasing an egg. It also thickens the cervical mucus, making it harder for sperm to swim up into the uterus. Finally, it makes the lining of the uterus, or endometrium, thinner and less welcoming for a pregnancy. Immediately after insertion, women may experience slight bruising and discomfort. Side effects include changes in menstrual bleeding patterns, including initial spotting and cramping. Many women find that they have less predictable, lighter periods as time goes on. Other possible side effects may include headache, weight increase, acne, breast pain, and abdominal pain. All of the options I've described are safe for use with migraines and shouldn't make migraines worse or more frequent. You pause and say, I know that I've covered a lot of information in a short time. What questions do you have? Jenna says that she can't think of any now and that she's leaning toward the copper IUD just because it can stay in place for up to 10 years. You ask if she'd like to take some time to think over her options and maybe even discuss them with her partner. She says she thinks that's a good idea. You give her written information to take with her and schedule a follow-up visit for the following week. Jenna returns to the office with her partner in a week, having decided she would like to use the copper IUD. You go through the informed consent process, making sure to cover possible complications in more detail, that she should return to the office or go to the emergency room if she is able to feel part of the IUD besides the threads, has severe cramping, or has severe bleeding. That she can use an over-the-counter NSAID like ibuprofen for mild to moderate cramping. And that you will want to see her again for a follow-up appointment three to six weeks after insertion, although you know this is no longer a strict practice guideline. She signs the informed consent form and you give her detailed written information about aftercare and warning signs to take with her. You perform the IUD insertion without incident.